Hi everyone, and welcome back to Know Your Data, the data literacy project series where we help you make sense of all the data, charts, and terms that we see every day about coronavirus. I'm Kevin Hannigan, the Chief Learning Officer of Click, and as always, our co-host is Alan Schwartz, a former Pulitzer Prize nominated reporter for the New York Times and fellow, in his words, stat head. Today, we'll talk about something that will someday be good news a statistical term that could help bring an end to the coronavirus era, herd immunity. What is herd immunity? How do we measure it? And most importantly, how do we accomplish it? Alan, please get us started. Thanks, Kevin. You know, it's like we can't even turn our heads these days without seeing headlines about herd immunity. What is herd immunity and how can we achieve it with COVID-19? The world is still far from herd immunity for coronavirus. And my personal favorite, want COVID-19 herd immunity? It's like gut milk. But uh, you know, what is herd immunity? It's an estimate of what percentage of a population that needs to become immune to a disease in order for that disease to not necessarily die out, which is basically impossible, but to at least become extremely rare and avoid outbreaks. It's not an exact threshold, but a guideline that gives you something to shoot for that can really protect almost everyone from getting sick. People can become immune either by vaccination or by getting the disease and developing antibodies. Now, as an example, I'll get into later, the herd immunity threshold for the measles, which spreads incredibly fast, is about 95%. SARS, maybe 40 to 60. And with the coronavirus, we still don't know. Some say it could be 40%, others say 80%. We just don't, don't know yet the data will ultimately show us. And then are we there yet? Are we there yet? Like kids in the backseat of a car, we all want to get to herd immunity really quickly. Let's hurry up and get there. You know, here's a fellow uh, who, who's really pretty excited about getting there. And, you know, that's all fine and dandy. But because we have no vaccine for COVID-19 yet, and there's no treatment, it overwhelms hospitals, and it's deadly, we have been doing everything we can to keep people from getting it and developing those antibodies. We're really waiting for a vaccine to get that herd immunity threshold to get there. Now, one thing that's very important as we move forward, we still don't know if getting COVID-19 and having some natural antibodies means immunity. We don't know how accurate antibody testing is. We don't know yet how effective widespread a vaccine will be. So please do not consider this, any of this medical advice. We're having a statistical discussion during which we will assume that having antibodies does make you immune and that having the vaccine makes you uh, immune. We don't know that yet, but Kevin, take it away. Thanks, Alan. So let's dive into herd immunity and talk about the threshold for achieving it. The threshold is the percentage of the population that needs to be immune to the disease to make it so unlikely for an infected person to run into a susceptible person that transmissions are kept rare. How rare? Well, in some ways, we decide that as a society. The rarer we want a disease, we have to set that threshold higher to achieve it. Most of the time, the herd immunity threshold means that the disease doesn't grow. Each person with the disease doesn't give it to more than one other person. The threshold calculation is actually a very simple and direct function of R, the statistic which we have talked a lot about in this series. As a reminder, R is the multiple of new cases that existing cases are generating on average. If that value is above one, the disease grows. If it's under one, the, decre the disease decreases at different rates. For herd immunity, we generally set our goal R at one so the population of people with it, which is hopefully already very low, at least isn't growing. The table on the screen highlights various diseases and the corresponding R and threshold values. Mumps, for example, has an R between four and seven, which leads the herd immunity threshold to be about 80%. SARS has an R between two and five, meaning it's less contagious than mumps, so you can have a lower herd immunity percentage, roughly 60 to 70%. Now, as you go down the table on the screen, you can see that some of the R values have a big range, like SARS, 
COVID-19, and Ebola. Other diseases have a tighter range, like diphtheria, with a range of between six and seven. This is because the diseases are older and we have more data on them. We're still learning about diseases like SARS and COVID. Now, with a lot of these diseases, we've already got vaccines and natural immunities. So the R's in real life have been knocked down a lot already. The challenge we have with COVID-19 is that it's a new disease. No one had immunity when this started only about six months ago. So we're starting with a very high R and have a lot of work to do. So how do we figure out how to get that R to one? Actually, it's very straightforward. The calculation is one minus the goal R over the disease's natural R. Now remember for herd immunity, we set the goal R at one. The disease's natural R is the rate at which the disease would spread without any intervention. So it's our starting point. Now with COVID-19, the natural R is estimated to be about three. We saw estimates of between 1.4 to 3.9, but for this simple example, we'll go roughly in the middle with three. So this means the threshold for herd immunity would be one minus one over three, which comes out to 67%. Remember the calculations typically use one as the goal R though, like we did in this example. This means the disease won't grow, but also it won't ever die out. It's ultimately up to the country or whoever to decide what goal R they wanna to get to. The lower the goal R that's used, the faster the number of new cases decreases. Let's go back to our threshold calculation for COVID-19 and see what happens if we wanna have a goal R of 0.9 the herd immunity threshold now becomes 70%. So we have a higher herd immunity threshold than when the goal R was one, but as a result, we also have the number of cases of the disease decreasing more quickly. Now on the screen, you can see that it's a very direct relationship between the goal R and the herd immunity threshold you need to get to. If authorities determine they wanna speed up the decrease of COVID-19 really quickly, say with a goal R of 0.4, now the herd immunity threshold jumps to 87%. So Kevin, you know, as, as we know, we've seen this herd immunity threshold stuff play out before. And a great example is measles through the second half of the 1900s. A vaccine has made measles incredibly rare in the developed world now, but it wasn't always that way. And we'll see that in a moment. What's also interesting is some similarities between measles and COVID. Both are transmitted via airborne droplets. There's no real treatment. The incubation period is long. It can take from 10 to 12 days for an infected person to develop symptoms and then quarantine. Now, the opposite is that measles mostly affects children rather than older people, but still about two out of every thousand children who do get the measles die. And we forget that sometimes. But let's look at the United Kingdom from 1940 to 1970. They averaged about 400,000 cases a year, just the UK alone. And it fluctuated because of different sizes of outbreaks, but we're talking about a half a million a year. But let's look and see what happens in the late 1960s. A vaccine is introduced and begins being adopted more widely. The dotted line represents the percentage of people who got the vaccine. And as that line goes up, the number of cases goes down way down fast and then in 1988 when the MR, mmr vaccine is introduced vaccination goes up to 90 percent and cases become so rare that we can't even see them on this screen so that's the success we're looking for but one thing we also know is how fragile herd immunity can be especially among populations that do not get their children vaccinated in 1991 in philadelphia an outbreak had 1,400 people getting the disease, nine children died, and perhaps the most famous situation came in late 2014 at Disneyland in California. One person there was infected, and within a few months, there were more than 100 more, ranging into seven states, even Canada. And one thing that's really fascinating and maybe scary, depending on your outlook, is that a few of the kids who got the measles at Disneyland did have the vaccine. They were vaccinated and it's like, wait a minute, but even if you get the vaccine, even if you get two doses of the vaccine, 
which the CDC recommends, there's still a risk. And, and let's look at the numbers. Let's talk about the numbers real quick. It's a fact that uh, getting the vaccine only has a 94% chance of working. So six out of 100 people are still going to be susceptible to the disease. Now, a second vaccine will knock down that 6% even faster, but it's never going to get to zero for all sorts of reasons. And that's an important thing to remember. When the COVID-19 vaccine comes along, and there's every reason to think that it will, there's a difference between reaching herd immunity and having no risk at all, even if vaccination is widespread. So the disease won't disappear necessarily, but can get really rare like we saw with the measles. Thanks, Alan. So as we wrap up this episode, let's take a look at our three key takeaways. First, the herd immunity threshold is an estimate of what percentage of a population needs to become immune to a disease in order for the disease to at least become extremely rare. Current estimates show the herd immunity threshold for COVID-19 to be about 70%, but the disease is still new and we still have so much to learn about it. So the actual threshold is somewhere within a wide range. Now with COVID-19, as Alan mentioned, there is no vaccine yet and there's also no treatment. In, in addition, the disease can overwhelm hospitals and it is deadly. So this makes achieving the herd immunity threshold in the short term, not practical. We've been trying to drop the R down by social distancing and tracing to buy us time till we have a vaccine and or a treatment in place. So Kevin, as we wrap things up for everybody, I have exciting news. We will be entering a new era for the Data Literacy Project's Know Your Data series. We are gonna be moving this to LinkedIn Live next week, where we'll talk about some of our more popular topics, but also take questions live from the audience in real time. So you should want to join us for that. It's at 11 a.m., 11 in the morning, Eastern time on Tuesday, June 16th. So join us, ask questions, we'll handle them, Kevin and me, and uh, we'll probably be talking about the R number and why it's so crucial in understanding much of the COVID data that we're all seeing every single day. So listen, everyone, thank you and we will see you on LinkedIn Live next week.